you want a war, you're gonna get one. Forget the lies, the money. We're in this together and through it out. They said that nothing's forever. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 4th of November 1996. As always, we're going to watch WCW Nitro and WWF Raw to see which show was the best on this Monday night. Raw is still showing taped matches from Fort Wayne, Indiana, while Monday Nitro is live tonight from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Let's check out the first 60 minutes of Nitro to start things off, but just before that, a big thank you to everyone who subscribed to the channel over these past few weeks. It really helps me and the channel a lot. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so. I'd be really grateful for your support. Okay, let's get started then. This is Reliving the War, episode 56. From this point on, Raw started one hour early in order to compete more effectively with WCW Nitro. But I'm just going to continue scoring the way we always have with Raw going up against Nitro's second hour. I think it makes more sense to have the show's main events going head to head instead of Raw's final match going up against a WCW mid-card bout, but in saying that also, it isn't too long now before Raw goes to a 2 hour format anyway, and I don't think anyone wants the last 60 minutes of Nitro summarised instead of the first 60 minutes, so I'm just going to keep things as normal. Monday Nitro begins and we see Sting in the rafters. The icon's motivations and intentions are still unknown at this moment. The Giant, Vincent and Ted DiBiase are also in the audience keeping an eye on the Stinger. Tony and Larry let us know that a tournament is going to begin tonight to crown a new WCW Women's Champion. The first tournament match is going to happen on tonight's Nitro and the tournament concludes at Starcade 96. Eric Bischoff is not in the arena tonight, he's in Portland, Oregon trying to meet Roddy Piper in order to sign a pay-per-view match between Hulk Hogan and the Hot Rod, a match that Tony Schiavone calls the match of the decade. Not so sure about that. Marcus Bagwell defeated Brad Armstrong in our opening contest. It was a solid matchup that ended with Marcus hitting a high-impact crossbody for the pinfall win. Diamond Dallas Page then defeated Ice Train next. Teddy Long came to the ring with Ice Train and Nick Patrick officiated the contest. There's a great spot where Dallas gets thrown on Patrick after Train kicks out of a pinfall attempt. The audience absolutely loved this. But just like last week, things got really interesting when Scott Hall and Kevin Nash again showed up during a DDP match. This time they got in the ring and attacked Page's opponent while Nick Patrick was outside tending to Dallas. The attack gave Page a chance to hit the diamond cutter and Dallas scores another win on Monday Nitro. Six watches the Dean Malenko vs Scotty Riggs match from the audience. This was a pretty short match but it also serves as the beginning of the end for the American males. Riggs ends up falling to the outside from the top rope and instead of letting his partner recuperate, Bagwell throws Riggs back into the ring. Malenko then pins Riggs and the match comes to an end. The American males argue after the bout. Hector Guerrero is going to defend the Guerrero family's honour by taking on Chris Benoit. Kevin Sullivan appears via split screen and a Falls Count Anywhere match is promoted between the Taskmaster and Chris Benoit. The match is going to take place at a house show in the Baltimore arena and Sullivan says he's going to prove what type of man he is by defeating Chris Benoit. It's a bit weird that they're promoting a house show match but sure. We only get around 3 minutes of action here, but it's a good 3 minutes. Hector could still go in late 1996, but thanks to woman, Chris Benoit is able to score a pinfall win. After the bout, Double F fucking Fraud comes in for an interview with Benoit and Steve McMichael. Jared begins answering questions about Ric Flair and Arn Anderson's injuries, and Benoit isn't very happy about it. Chris says that any business pertaining to the horseman will be dealt with by a horseman. Mongo tells Mike Tanay to look at his shirt. It says four horsemen, and Mongo announces that this horseman interview is now over as Jared gets left behind with Mike Tanay. Jared then talks about WCW needing leadership and how Ric Flair said that Double J has what it takes. 
I'm giving the unopposed point to Nitro this week. Interesting stuff going on with the Outsiders and Paige. We have the American males arguing among themselves. And the Benoit vs Hector Guerrero match was interesting, if just a little short. We've got an important night for the WWF. Brian Pillman has invited the company to his home for an interview, and things are going to take a turn for the worse. The Owen and Bulldog vs Sid and Sean match is not happening tonight. Instead, we have a face to face interview with HBK and Psycho Sid, and next week we're going to see the tag match. Kevin Kelly is shown outside Pillman's home. Kelly says that Pillman is quite tense this evening due to Steve Austin threatening to show up. But Kevin says an interview will take place later on and Brian will have a chance to talk about his injury. Goldust vs The Stalker is our first Raw match while Medusa takes on Reina Yabuki. The Stalker and Goldust come to the ring with their respective Survivor Series teams. Rocky Maivia is here making another televised appearance before his Survivor Series debut. As Goldust begins going to work on his opponent, Doc Hendricks appears to say Steve Austin is currently on the phone and he wants to speak with Vince McMahon. Austin says he's in his rental car, he's left the airport, and he's on his way to Brian Pullman's home. The stalker takes control inside the ring while Vince McMahon tells Austin that Pillman has friends surrounding his home and it wouldn't be wise to infiltrate the Pillman residence at this very moment. Austin doesn't care. Lawler says that Pillman said last week he has a gun in his home, and again, Austin doesn't care. Stalker hits a body slam in the ring followed by a figure four, but Marlena rakes Wyndham's eyes to break the hold. Goldust gets a chance to take the lead, but he finds himself on the outside of the ring. The Babyface Survivor Series team throw Goldust back inside the ropes to continue the match. The Stalker hits a back body drop followed by a gut wrench suplex. Jerry Lawler has now joined the heels in supporting Goldust. Wyndham sets Goldust up on the top rope, but Goldust gets out of this predicament by kissing his opponent. Goldust's follow-up aerial attack gets stopped by Wyndham before we take a break. And the WWF then show a great Steve Austin promo video for the 1996 Survivor Series. We go back to the arena and the competitors fall out of the ring. This leads to a brawl breaking out between the two teams at ringside and the referee rules the match as a double disqualification. Rocky Maivia loses his footing when going for a flying crossbody, but he gets there in the end. And the heel team end up getting cleared out of the ring as Raw moves on to its next match. A very average opening bout, the focus was on Steve Austin and Brian Pillman, and this is a theme that runs throughout this entire episode of Monday Night Raw. WCW have brought in a ton of international superstars to compete in this women's championship tournament, most of which are Japanese and they're from the Gaia promotion. And it makes you wonder why they're even bothering crowning a WCW women's champion, but anyway. The match gets underway with Yabuki going on offense. Tony Schiavone seems surprised that Medusa's opponent wrestles while wearing that feathered headgear. Reyna grabs Medusa by the hair and Medusa gets brought down to the mat. Mike Tanay explains that this is only Yabuki's second match in the United States as Medusa gets choked beside the ropes. Yabuki then lifts Medusa up by the neck before slamming her opponent down hard, and Yabuki then begins biting Medusa's fingers on the mat. It's funny because Mike Tanay has been talking about Reyna being a high flyer, but so far she's done nothing but brawl. Reyna then begins biting Medusa's toes. Keep in mind that Medusa has footwear on, so yeah, that's pretty fucking stupid. Zero then makes an appearance, better known as Shigusa Nagayo. And Tony explains that Zero is currently one of the most famous women wrestlers in all of Japan. As Medusa begins her comeback, Sonny Ono, who is managing Zero, says that Medusa is the perfect representation of America. She's a chemical dumping ground filled with peroxide and falling plastic. <laughs> ono also says that Medusa reminds him of an American car. Medusa goes for a spin kick, but Yabuki pushes her opponent down to the mat. Yabuki then goes to the middle rope, but Medusa comes back with a handstand head scissors. Medusa seems happy with her work. Eventually, Reyna turns it around and she performs a missile dropkick. Medusa kicks out at two, and Medusa is then able to win the match with a pinning German suplex. It's interesting seeing these new faces in WCW, but gotta be honest too, the match was average. No points for either show. 
Doc Hendricks runs down the Survivor Series card and he also shows an interview from the WWF's Big Bag Boom Tour. Doc interviewed Mankind here and it's revealed that Paul Bear will be suspended above the ring in his own personal shark cage during the Mankind vs Undertaker bout at Survivor Series. The Undertaker speaks as a cage gets lowered into the arena and inside the cage there's a crude Paul Bear dummy hanging upside down. Spooky stuff. The executioner was also present for this interview. The Brian Pillman interview begins on WWF Raw next while Michael Wall Street battles Chris Jericho on Nitro. The Pillman interview gets interrupted with the Milton Bradley Karate Fighters tournament so let's cover that first and get it out of the way. We have Psycho Sid battling Marlena. Todd Pettengill thinks Psycho Sid is going to win this one and Todd was absolutely right. No gimmicks, no shenanigans, Sid just beats the fuck out of his opponent like the karate fighter's master that he truly is. Sid advances to the next round and next week we have Sable vs Doc Hendricks. Look at this picture of Doc Hendricks by the way. Okay, over to Brian Pillman. Kevin Kelly wants to know how Brian is holding up after the Pillmanizing spot on Superstars. Pillman says he's fine and he should be back in action in 1997, but Pillman wants to talk about Stone Cold Steve Austin. Brand says there's a fine line between business and private lives, Austin crossed that line, and now Brand Pillman is operating under a new set of rules. Vince McMahon then tells Pillman that Austin is on his way to his home, and Vince wants to know if Brand feels like a hostage in his own house. Brian laughs this off saying that Steve Austin is a dead man walking because when Austin 316 meets Pillman 9mm Glock, Pillman is gonna blast Austin's ass straight to hell. This right here got the WWF in hot water with the USA Network. A wrestling angle that featured a gun was maybe pushing the envelope a little too far but still this right here is absolutely iconic. When we come back from a commercial break, Austin is seen beating up Pillman's friends outside the Pillman residence. It was uncommon to see brawls like this take place on Monday Night Raw, as you guys watching this series know. And Stone Cold uses everything he finds to take care of these two guys who are trying to protect Brian Pillman. Stone Cold tries to get in the front door, but it's locked. And the segment ends with Stone Cold walking around the house to find a way in. Michael Wall Street vs Chris Jericho then on Monday Nitro. Lionheart gets his wrist twisted up at the beginning of the bout but Jericho is able to suplex Wall Street and apply an armbar, one of Chris Jericho's 1004 holds. As Wall Street brings Jericho to the corner, the commentary team wonder if Sting will enter the World War 3 Battle Royal on pay per view. Shivani says that WCW still needs a leader and Heenan says Sting has a great chance if he clears his mind. Jericho hits a crossbody on Wall Street, he then nails a hip toss followed by a jumping back kick, and so far Y2J has looked really good here. Chris nails a headlock takedown and Wall Street takes a break on the mat. When the two men get up, Jericho gets thrown to the outside where he begins favouring his knee. He tries to get back into the ring but Wall Street is right there with some big clubbing blows and Chris is forced back to the outside. To get back inside the ropes, Chris pulls off a schoolboy pin from the apron into the ring, again this looked good, and Wall Street replies by locking in an abdominal stretch while using the ring ropes to his advantage. This goes on for quite some time until Mark Curtis forces a break. Wall Street then applies a chin lock, a chin lock that gets applied for so long that the producers cut to an arena shot while the hold was still locked in. Jericho gets out with a jawbreaker, Wall Street then gets his head rammed into the turnbuckle a few times, and when he gets whipped into the opposite corner, Wall Street just crumbles to the mat. Wall Street gets back up and he tries to backdrop Jericho to the outside. Chris stays on the apron, Wall Street gets hung up on the top rope, and Chris hits a diving dropkick, getting a great ovation when doing so. On the outside, Wall Street's able to throw Chris into the ring post, Wall Street thinks he has the match won, but back inside the ropes, Jericho surprises his opponent with a small package and Chris Jericho wins via pinfall. A good match here and a fine showcase of Jericho's abilities, but I'm giving the point to Raw. The Pillman stuff is just so fascinating to look back on. Nick Patrick and his little bitch attorney are going to cut another promo on Nitro, 
while WWF presents The Sultan vs Alex the Pug Porto, along with more footage from Brian Pullman's home. The Pug is getting quite a lot of matches lately on Raw, isn't he? A lot of matches that he never wins. Bob Backlund screams that the Sultan is going to bring us into the 21st century as the WWF Champion while Vince McMahon talks about the, quote, uncomfortable and disturbing events going down at the home of Brian Pillman. McMahon says we'll go back to Pillman's home if anything happens during this matchup. Porto tries to start off strong, but Sultan makes his opponent look like a chump by tripping up the pug twice. The Sultan then delivers a belly to belly suplex as McMahon says he really hopes this stuff with Austin and Pillman doesn't get out of hand. Porto gets his head rammed into the curled toe boot of the Sultan and a back suplex gets delivered afterwards. A headlock takedown follows from the Sultan and the commentators are not talking about this match at all. All the focus is on Pillman and Steve Austin, and rightfully so. After nailing a backbreaker, the Sultan applies the camel clutch. He makes Alex Porto humble, and our match comes to an end. It was an absolute squash match, and not a very entertaining one either. The real good stuff happens next. We go back to Pillman's home, Bran is getting ready for Austin's arrival, and Stone Cold breaks a window in order to open up a door. Stone Cold comes into Brian's house, Brian aims his weapon, and the video feed gets cut off. It's an important segment in Raw history. A lot of people say this was the beginning of the Attitude Era, and while I don't agree with that statement at all, it was the first time the WWF seemingly left their younger audience behind. Vince wanted a big angle to go along with Raw's new time slot, and the USA Network signed off on this segment beforehand but the network ended up being unhappy with how realistic it all came across. And on top of that, they were unhappy with an F-bomb that slipped out later in the show. They threatened to pull Raw completely, they got calls from angry parents and angry advertisers, and it's one of those things where you gotta weigh up the pros and cons and come to your own conclusion about the angle. One thing is for sure though, it really did make Pillman look like a loose cannon, and it also made Steve Austin look like a fearless badass, so in terms of character development, it definitely worked. In the end, the WWF and Pillman had to apologise for the holy gun thing and the swear word that slipped out during the final segment. Some people don't like this whole Pillman thing, others do. Personally, I thought it was really good. Mike Tanay wants to talk to Nick Patrick, but Alan Sharp, Patrick's attorney, tells Tanay that all questions have to go through him first. Jericho overhears this and he joins the interview. Chris cuts to the chase by saying everyone knows there's nothing wrong with Nick Patrick's neck, and Jericho also says that Patrick is being paid by the NWO. This is turning into the exact same promo as last week. Teddy Long then comes out to defend Chris Jericho, and Long says that everyone saw the Outsiders attack Ice Train while Nick Patrick did absolutely nothing about it. Patrick's attorney tells Long that after doing some digging, it turns out that Long himself got suspended from his WCW refereeing duties after making a few mistakes. Jericho says everyone makes mistakes, but what Nick Patrick is doing is completely of his own will. There's no mistakes being made here. Patrick is choosing to be a bad referee. Ted DiBiase and Vincent watch the promo from the audience, and just like last week, nothing comes of it. Sultan vs Porto was pretty bad, but those few moments afterwards with Pillman were really something else. Sid and Shawn Michaels have the unfortunate task of following Pillman and Austin when they have an in-ring interview segment, while WCW gives us a rematch from last week, Booker T vs Lex Luger. HBK and Sid come down to the ring, Jim Ross is going to interview both men but the commentators are still very shaken up by what's happened at Pillman's home. Ross reminds us that Sean and Sid are going to team up next week but at the Survivor Series, these two are going to be in the main event in a one on one match. We see footage of Sid nailing Sean with power bombs after Wrestlemania 11, and Sean says he's forgiven Sid for taking him out all the way back in April of 1995. HBK says it was he who went to the quote loony bin to get Sid back into the World Wrestling Federation so there's no hard feelings on Sean's part. Sid replies by saying, First of all, that's bullshit. HBK says that Sid knows where he was before Sean brought him back and he leaves it at that. 
Ross wants to know why Sid elbowed Sean last week. Sid calls Jim Ross fatso while explaining that it was a mistake, and if Sean doesn't believe him, well, then that's on Sean. Sean says it's done, HBK has moved on, but at Survivor Series, Sid is going down to the Heartbreak Kid. Sean has beaten Sid once, and he'll beat him again. When Ross calls Sid the favourite at the 1996 Survivor Series due to his size, Sid says that it's not just his size that makes him a favourite, it's also his ability. Sean immediately disagrees, HBK says it's Sid's abilities that will always be his downfall. Sean says that Sid isn't in his league, and Sid agrees, Sid says he isn't in the little league. Sean quotes Ric Flair by saying, to be the man, you gotta beat the man, and this makes Sid laugh. Sean eventually pushes the podium away and the two men come face to face. Sean tells Sid to keep his hands off Jose Lothario when Jose begins getting a little too close to the big man. The voice of Jim Cornette echoes around the arena. Jim, Vader, Owen and Davey march to the ring. As Cornette says, it should be Vader getting the title shot at Survivor Series, not Psycho Sid. A brawl breaks out where Owen Hart hits Sid with a steel chair, and when Sean takes the chair away from Owen, Sid thinks it was HBK who hit him. The heels get back into the ring and Sean and Sid clean house, but the tensions continue to rise as Raw moves on to its next segment. Let's see if Booker T and Lex Luger is as good as last week's effort. Luger cuts a split screen promo at the beginning of the match. He wants to talk to his old friend Sting. Lex says Sting won't answer his calls, and he hopes the NWO's advances towards his old friend are also falling on deaf ears. Luger hits a big shoulder block to start the match off. Booker T comes back with a wrist lock followed by a headlock. Lex then fights his way out of a waist lock before hitting a big vertical suplex. And just like last week, the audience is really behind the total package tonight. A back elbow knocks Booker T out of the ring and Nitro takes a commercial break. We come back and Luger fights his way out of a suplex attempt. Lex then lifts up Booker T and he hits a British Bulldog style running power slam. I sound like a broken record here, but it can't be overstated how much the fans love Lex Luger. They're popping for everything he does. Booker replies with a stun gun and Luger begins selling his neck. A perfect scissors kick from Booker T is enough to hush the crowd for a little bit, and Lex finds himself on the outside of the ring where Sister Sherry is able to get in a cheap shot. Luger takes more punishment outside the ring as our match continues. The competitors get back inside the ropes and Booker tries to pin Lex, but Luger kicks out at two. Luger takes a standing heel kick from Booker T that rocks the total package, but Booker messes up when going for a jumping sidekick. Booker gets caught on the top rope and he gets a ridiculous amount of air when Luger begins pushing the rope up into his little suckers, no, his little spinneroonies, no, I don't know, his balls. Luger hits a power slam before signaling for the torture rack, but Booker holds onto the ropes so Lex can't lift him up. Luger tries to soften Booker up a little, but this was a mistake. Booker nails that jumping sidekick and Lex is not in trouble. Just then, that motherfucker Colonel Robert Parker shows up to give Sherry a hug. Booker goes for an aerial attack and when Parker gets on the apron, Booker grabs his former manager. Lex takes this opportunity to pin Booker T and Lex wins via pinfall. Parker tries to explain himself to Sherry as Sting watches on from the rafters. This was another solid Booker T vs Luger match. I enjoyed this more than the HBK and Sid promo, so it's a point for Nitro. Main event time, we have another Hulk Hogan promo to end Nitro. That's three weeks in a row Hogan has wrapped up WCW's flagship show. And over on Raw, we have Mark Merrow vs the fake Razor Ramon, along with the conclusion to the Brian Pullman stuff. Sable comes to the ring with Mark Merrow, and the fake Diesel comes to the ring with Razor Ramon. Vince McMahon is talking about how some WWF superstars take things too far and get carried away. This is what possibly happened at the Pillman residence, but Jerry Lawler blames Pillman, while McMahon blames Austin. Jim Ross is joining the commentary team also for this bout, and yeah, here we go, how bad could this be? Razor overpowers Merrow twice to start things off, and the wild man fires back with a drop to a hold and an arm drag. Razor gets put in an arm bar as Kerwin Selfies calls into Raw. McMahon introduces Kerwin as part of the technical crew at the Pillman residence. 
but Kerwin was actually the director of all live WWF programming. The last I heard, Kerwin got furloughed in 2020 and I'm not sure if he's been brought back yet. But anyway, Kerwin says the WWF crew are in the satellite truck around 50 feet away from the Pullman home. All the power went out along with the power in the production truck so no one knows what happened after the feed got cut. Kerwin hasn't seen Stone Cold, nobody has came out of the house, and Austin's car is still in the driveway. Mero continues to work over Razor's arm as Kerwin says there was some sort of explosion noises heard at the Pillman residence and the crew are currently trying their best to get the video feed back up and running. Mero hits a fireman's carry just before Raw takes a commercial break and when we come back Mero is using Razor's head as a punching bag. Razor begins making a comeback when Mero misses an aerial attack. And Kerman Selfies again phones into Raw, apparently the crew are still trying to restore the video feed and the authorities still haven't arrived on the scene. Razor begins stumbling through the match a little as Vince McMahon loses Kerman on the phone, even the phone lines are down around the Pullman home apparently. Razor has Mero on the mat as Jim Ross and Vince McMahon begin bickering on commentary. Ross is blaming Vince for this whole thing and Jerry Lawler is actually being the voice of raising telling both guys to get it together and call the match, a match that has been incredibly boring so far. Mero comes back with a back suplex, he follows up with a knee lift and the wild man hits a nice top rope dropkick that at least gets the crowd a little excited. McMahon announces that Mr Perfect is going to be a guest on Livewire as Mero hits a top rope Frankensteiner and Vince apologises if the commentary team aren't as lively as they usually are. Speaking of Mr Perfect, he and Triple H come down to ringside, Mero signals for the wild thing as Perfect distracts Earl Hebner, Helmsley pushes Mero off the top rope and this allows Razor to hit the Razor's edge. Mark Mero gets defeated by the fake Razor Ramon, I wonder what Mark did to piss Vince McMahon off. A poor main event from WWF Raw but we aren't done yet. The video feed has been restored over at the Pillman house where Brian's friends are keeping him held down. Steve Austin then makes an appearance screaming for Pillman to pull the trigger but Stone Cold gets escorted out. If you listen closely you'll hear Pillman drop that f-bomb that I talked about earlier. Alright. Raw goes off the air with Melanie Pillman crying and Brian Pillman screaming for Stone Cold to come back. The end of Nitro was absolutely terrible, just letting you know now. Eric Bischoff phones in to update everybody on the Roddy Piper negotiations. Remember, Bischoff is trying to sign a Piper vs Hogan match for a future pay per view. Bischoff says that things have went well, Roddy Piper wants to have the match but there's a problem with Piper's managers and agents, the negotiations with Piper's people haven't been favourable. Shivani wants to know what the hang up is and Bischoff says he isn't sure, he's not sure if it's a money thing, a scheduling thing or just a WCW thing, Bischoff couldn't get the match officially signed. Eric says he's gonna talk to Roddy one to one next Tuesday and Bischoff is hoping to get the Piper vs Hogan match booked after talking to the Hot Rod on a more personal level. The Halloween Havoc 1996 promo then gets aired one more time and again it's nearly the whole thing in its entirety. Hulk Hogan then comes out to cut another promo, he asks for a Hollywood spotlight to be placed on him and doesn't this all feel very very familiar? Hogan says that the Cable Ace Awards are coming up and Ted Turner has a front row seat. Hulk says he wants to win an award and if he doesn't, he promises to crash the party and take away Ted Turner's award. Hogan said he tried to make Roddy Piper make a move at Halloween Havoc, he wanted Piper to fight him at the pay per view, but apparently Piper has no heart and he's afraid to wrestle Hogan. Hogan says that Piper is probably sitting beside Randy Savage right now in a retirement home, Hollywood Hogan is the master and Hollywood Hogan is our NWO champion. Hulk decides to pose again to end Monday Nitro, it's just the same as last week. I can't give Nitro a point here for this and the Raw main event was pretty bad too, so no points for either main event this week. We've got a draw this week, over on WWF Raw the Pillman's Got A Gun stuff was really good but everything else about the show was either average or pretty bad. Over on Nitro the Lex Luger match and the Hector Guerrero matches were pretty good but everything else again was pretty average. 
WWF Raw managed to get a substantial boost in viewership during the main Brian Pullman segment, but in the end, Nitro still beat Raw in the television ratings with a 3.4. The WWF managed a 2.3. Next week, Rey Mysterio battles Ciclope on Nitro and the American males try to get back on the same page when they take on the Faces of Fear. Over on Raw, we get formally introduced to Rocky Maivia, while the relationship between Psycho Sid and Shawn Michaels completely falls apart. I hope to see you all next week, and thank you very, very much for watching this week's episode of Reliving the War. A big, big thank you to my supporters over on Patreon who help bring these videos to you each and every week. Reliving the War simply wouldn't be a weekly show if it wasn't for viewers coming over to Patreon to show their support, so you can thank these guys for bringing this very show to your screens. Tom Eddy and Rob T are two guys who joined up as Hall of Famers recently, so I just want to give these guys a personal shout out and a personal thank you for helping out. The links to Patreon are in the video description if you want to join up, and even if you don't, you can also help out by simply subscribing to the channel. Again, thank you very, very much and take care.